Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. Good evening. And um, uh, we're going to be continuing our study. Okay, <clears throat> so we're going to continue the study on uh, of the Gospel in Galatians, uh, a review by E.J. Wagner, which, of course, is a continuation of this study on the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. Uh, before we begin, uh, can you join me in a word of prayer? A dear, gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this past week and for the Sabbath that's here and the blessings of it. And we just invite your presence again into our heart, into our lives, into this study. Um, we know that we face struggles each day, each moment with self. And so we uh, yield our lives to you and we ask that you can continue to teach us and that we can learn of the meekness and lowliness of Christ in the school of Christ. That we can take up that yoke, yoke up with Christ. I pray for each person who is studying. Um, you know the struggles that all of us are facing, the trials. And um, we just ask, Lord, that uh, uh, you can strengthen us and that the truths that we uh, take into our mind will I'll fortify it against the assaults of the enemy. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, last study, we went through... Um, I'm having trouble seeing with those glasses. We went through uh, my favorite part of Wagner's book, and this is where Wagner addresses uh, the nature of Christ. The, the whole point is that Christ is is born of a woman born under the law. And so he's he's born under the law. That is, he's born under its condemnation. He's not just subject to the law. And and of course, Butler's view is that well, Christ was he says that under the law means to be subject to the law. And and that law, he says, is is the ceremonial law. And so it, all it would be saying is that Christ was born of a woman, uh, born under or subject to uh, the ceremonial law, that basically he's just a Jew and he has to follow the ceremonial law. But of course, Christ came to die for all of us. Him being born under a woman, born of a woman, born under the law, means he's born under its condemnation. And, you know, this to me was, was a real revelation back when I was in my early 20s. And I started to understand this truth, what it meant. Um, and I didn't find it in Wagner and Jones first. I found it in the Spirit of Prophecy, actually the book Desire of Ages. Um, and also another book I had, which was a collection of Ellen White's uh, Review and Herald articles. Uh, it was in a book called Confrontation. So it's going to be uh, uh, Jesus in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. So it's it's an expansion of what you see in Desire of Ages. So originally she wrote longer sections when they put the book together. Uh, they trimmed trimmed it down a bit, but it's um, uh, was very very powerful uh, understanding the nature of Christ. Now, part of the thing back then in um, the 1980s, when I was first studying these things, we had a lot of new theology coming in, and there were people uh, sort of standing against it. People like the Standish brothers and. Uh, Hope International with Ron Spear and, and others. There was other people who were recognizing there was a problem. But I first figured this out without knowing about any of those people. So um, when I became an Adventist, I started um, studying. Um, when I read the book Desire of Ages, I threw out all the theology books that I had collected through the years, just put them in the garbage. Uh, because none of them had the truth in them. Um, maybe it's, you know, sometimes I wish I had some of those books because there was some interesting things in them. But for me at that time, it was once I read Desire of Ages, I knew what the truth was. And, and all of these books, they weren't talking about overcoming sin. They weren't showing me how I could change. It was more about just kind of accepting uh, salvation. 
So the idea that um, that the gospel is going to transform us in character just seemed to be something that no one was interested in. And the, 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 the Desire of Ages, that book, definitely teaches that. Adventism used to teach that. It's not taught very much anymore. So um, anyway, when when I then started hearing about all of these things and I started studying on my own Jones and Wagner's material, I knew that there was still a problem. That is, when I would read Jones and Wagner and then I would read the people who were opposing the new theology, that there was definitely a difference. It wasn't like, you know, they were teaching everything wrong. It's just there seemed to be something missing on that side of it. And and the real issue came to me over the nature of Christ. That is, um, and, I, and I told the story before a few times about, you know, with Ron Spear when I showed him what A.T. Jones had written in A Consecrated Way to Christian Perfection, which we looked at last week. He said it was heresy. And, and I would find that many people would sort of take a sideways glance when when I would talk about how I understood the nature of Christ, though there was a lot of people who said, you know, this was the truth and that they had never heard it before. So I sort of asked people, you know, what last week, you know, is this something new to you? You know, it's 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 something that the idea that Christ was feeling the weight of sin that he was feeling guilty, even as a child, all through his life, even though he never sinned, that that guilt was something he inherited. And and that idea, uh, for many people, they say, is original guilt or original sin. But you can see there's a difference. The idea of original sin is that you're born a sinner and you will sin because you're born a sinner. And that that you can never overcome that sin, right? That you, you can never have a truly a Christ-like character. You're always going to be dealing with this flesh and you're, and it's always going to be winning. But the Bible teaches that, um, the gospel changes us so that we would not do what we would, right? Because what we want to do is sin and we can be changed, right? So we can, we can over, overcome sin that, our nature can be conquered. And Christ did that for us. Now, he didn't just do it for us and said, well, he conquered it. Now you don't have to, which is what a lot of people teach. You know, Christ, he came and he lived the perfect life so that we don't have to live a perfect life. Now, it's true. We're going to have a past life that is imperfect. Right? Because we are sinners. We have sinned. All of sin didn't come short of the glory of God. But Christ promises us that he can give us his character. And it's not for us to look to ourselves to see that we have this character, to believe that we have it. Like Christ, he had to struggle uh, to know that he was not a sinner. Because he felt guilt his whole lifetime, he felt as a sinner feels. And if he looked at his life, he wouldn't see his life as perfect, even though he was perfect. He knew he was perfect only by faith because his father said, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Right. So he knew because of the word of God that he was the Messiah. But he didn't know that by his personal feelings. And as Christians, sometimes we have the idea that the only way that I can be sure that I am a Christian is if I see myself as righteous. But Christ never saw himself as righteous, not by sight, only by faith did he know um, that he was God's son. And so this idea is, I think, extremely important as we move uh, forward, especially during the time of Jacob's trouble, because during the times of Jacob's trouble, just like Christ, we have no memory of our actual sins. Our sins have gone beforehand to judgment. And have been blotted out so we could not bring them to remembrance. Ellen White says in the Great Controversy. So if we can't bring them to remembrance, but we still have a sense of our unworthiness, of our, our sinfulness, of our nature, we're in the same point 
that that Christ was in humanity. So Christ had no memory of actual sins, but he didn't feel like he was sinless because he had a sinful human nature. And we still have a sinful human nature after the close of probation. And we know there were people in the 60s, Brimsmead and stuff, who were saying there was going to be a change of nature and then and then we would be perfect, that we needed a change of nature. And we do need a change of nature, but not our physical nature, not our flesh. We need the mind of Christ. So this is what we've been learning as we've been going through what Jones has been saying, what Wagner has been saying. And, and I think it's the most important point in understanding the nature of Christ, that he's our example of, of perfect righteousness. And it's an example that he wants to work out in us. And that when we have that perfect righteousness, when we have a righteous character, we will not recognize it by sight. We will actually feel completely unworthy. The only reason that we can have a righteous character is we're going to have the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ did not see himself as righteous. His righteousness, he says, comes from the Father. And so somebody who's truly converted isn't looking to himself for righteousness. If you're looking to yourself for righteousness, you will see it, but it will be a deception. You'll see it at times. You'll think that you're better than other men are, like the Pharisee and the publican. The Pharisee thought he was good. He thought he was righteous. And, and you know that, too, that often people who are, you know, worldly, who um, they could even be in prison, you know, and they'll say, oh, well, I'm a good person. You know, there's things I don't do. They'll list the things that they don't do that shows they're a good person. Um, and so they're not aware because the light of the gospel hasn't shown them uh, their sinfulness. So if you see yourself as a sinner, you go to Christ and you trust in his righteousness. You don't wait to see that you're righteous before you go to Christ. You go to him and you go to him every day. Every time you come to God's word, it's going to show you that you need Christ. It's never going to show you that you're okay, right? If you, you can't possibly go to God's word and study it, you know, with the Holy Spirit and come back with the idea, boy, I'm a, I'm a lot better than other people. Do you guys agree? But the Bible's not going to show you that you're better than other people. Yes, or, yeah, or something might say, I'm better than I used to be, something like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, being better than you used to be, I don't know if that, that, you know, because we're all we're all sinners, so I don't I don't know how much better you have to be to be better, because um, we're sinners, right? That's how we have to see ourselves. That's what the gospel show. That's how people see themselves. Okay. Yeah, I know. It, it, you know, it's it's the Pharisee. You know, I'm thankful that I'm not like I used to be. Um, well, you know, it's true that we some areas of our lives have changed. But if we're going to trust in that, we're going to say, well, because, you know, I don't do some of the things I used to do, th then I'm safe. I'm OK. I know I'm on the right track, maybe. But yet we're still we're still captive by sin. Does it really matter? Is, you know, the Christian life is not an improvement of the old, Ellen White says, but it's a transformation. And so sometimes we're just satisfied with an improvement. You know, I don't do certain things I used to do before. But were those even the, really the things that, you know, those are things people can give up a lot of things. They can change. They can clean the outside of the cup quite easily. Um, but to actually deal with the, the heart, that's a whole other issue. And, and so we shouldn't be discouraged when we see ourselves as sinners. We should just go to Christ. So that's that was last week's study. Now, he's, he's going to get into another part of this study which is, well, it's not my favorite part of the study. I'll say that. Yeah, but, you know, he's he's bringing up some points that Butler's talking about. And these things are still important because they're um, they're part of the, the problem that people have with Galatians in trying to understand it. Now, there was um, some comments in the chat there, um, which I talked over. Okay, so Kelly wrote, 
I'm interested in hearing the answer to the question. Have you heard what righteousness is? How long ago was the first time you heard the truth of Christ's nature? And then you say, I'll go first, 1977, Pastor Watson. So what are you saying there, Kelly? Uh, oof, hands were wet. What was it? So, oh, just the nature of Christ. Because you'd asked that question. It was, mm-hmm. wasn't was so much of a question. It's just a, as you're talking, wondering yeah. if people have heard this idea before, these ideas. And they are... Uh, not common, and they do thrill the heart, heart when because it's so true. It has that ring of truth. But yeah. Pastor Watson was the first time I'd, I'd uh, heard these ideas, and not even realizing what they were. Like he never said, "Well, this yeah. is the Jones and Wagner message." He just <laughs> taught the truth. <laughs> it's pretty neat. I have his, uh, actually have his a uh, few of his notebooks from seminary, nineteen thirty or something in Australia. Oh, yeah, I'll show you those sometime. You'd probably think they're pretty neat. Yeah. 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 And, and it's, uh, yeah, and it's kind of weird that, um, you know, there, there would always be Adventists who understood this truth in some way. And I'm not even sure that everybody always understood, um, like the controversy over this issue, like in the past. Some of the people I know, you know, they just kind of, you know, they read the Bible in the spirit of prophecy and they understood certain things uh, from from doing that not really understanding that there was a controversy and that other people didn't understand it i remember uh one lady uh preached a, a sermon in warburg on um the nature of christ from the book desire of ages and that ended her marriage it, the the fact that she it, took that stand you know caused her her marriage to end I'm not going to go into the details of why, but it was not well received by uh, her husband and his parents. You know, so she wasn't really aware that there was this controversy. Right. She didn't know that it was going to be this hot topic. She was just studying the the book Desire of Ages. So anyway. um, Yeah. So this is something that um, we need to study. We need to understand for ourselves and to recognize that Christ felt all these things for us and that he's over, he's gone over this ground for us and he offers this as a gift to us. Not just that, you know, our sins are forgiven in the sense of, you know, you can continue, you know, they're just pardoned and you can continue sinning and you'll be fine, but that he gives us, uh, Forgive means to give for. So he's going to give for our sins his righteousness. And that's going to be a part of our life. So this next section, Wagner goes, he says, but this requires that I should show another absurdity in which your theory lands you. Maybe you shouldn't use the word absurdity. You know, it's like saying, you know, that's uh, ridiculous. Um, Can get you in trouble sometimes. Uh, The ceremonies of the Mosaic ritual were simply the gospel ordinances for that time. Um, What he probably could have said, you know, requires that I show you another place in which your theory breaks the rules of logic or something. But anyway, uh, the ceremonies of the Mosaic ritual were simply the gospel ordinances for that time. They were the things by which the people manifested their faith in the gospel of Christ. But your theory besides making Christ die for the sole purpose of allowing the Jews to stop offering lambs, etc., makes him die to deliver them from the soul, uh, deliver them from the gospel. If that were true, what kind of state would they then be in? And again, it makes Christ die to redeem men from that which had no power to condemn. In short, it nullifies the whole plan of salvation and makes nonsense of it. Right? So he's got absurdity, nonsense. Anyway, and so it is most positively proved that Galatians 4, verse 4 and 5 cannot by any possibility refer to what is commonly called the ceremonial law. It does refer to the moral law by which all men are condemned and from the condemnation of which Christ redeems all who believe in him, making them sons and heirs of God. 
In your claim that these elements refer to the ceremonial law, you say, the language concerning elements of the world, these weak and beggarly elements to which they desire to return, under which they had been in servitude, is utterly inconsistent to apply to the law, which is spiritual, holy, just, and good. So this is what Butler says, right? So he says, you can't be referring to the Ten Commandments as weak and beggarly elements, right? And of course, Wagner agrees with that. He says that is exactly the truth. But those elements of this world, those weak and beggarly elements, must be the exact opposite to the pure and holy law of God. And the opposite of that holy, just, and good law is sin. And sin, as I've already shown, is the elements of the world. It is that which worldly men practice by nature. It is that which comes naturally from the human heart and which, therefore, are the first things, the elements that people practice. I marvel how you can read Galatians 4.3 in connection with verses 8 and 10 and then say that the ceremonial law is referred to. Uh, those elements to which they had been in bondage and to which they wished to return were the elements which they practiced when they knew not God and the service which they did to them that were no gods. You yourself say the language clearly shows that the persons referred to had in some period of their lives been the worshipers of other gods. Then why not frankly admit that these elements to which they had been in bondage were the sinful practices of licentious idolaters? But I pass to your crowning argument on this point. You quote from page 65. The identification of these elements of the world, these weak and beggarly elements, into which the Galatians desired to return into bondage with the ceremonial law, is an important link in this argument. There can be no question that our position on this point is correct. Dr. Schaeff, in his comments on these rudiments, says, according to my view, the expression applies in any case only to Judaism, especially uh, to the law. And Apostle Paul uh, could not proper, possibly comprehend heathenism and Judaism under one idea, regarding them thus as virtually equivalent. Um, we trust our friends who sometimes endeavor to apply these rudiments partially to heathenism will consider this well. A Dr. Clark says on rudiments of the world, the rudiments are principles of the Jewish law, Jewish religion. He says also that the weak and beggarly elements were the ceremonies of the Mosaic law. Dr. Scott takes the same position. So you can see here that um, Butler is, is quoting Dr. Schaefe, a Dr. Clark, and Dr. Scott. His argument is not a biblical argument. And he says, you know, there's no question that our position on this point is correct because he's quoted uh, three people with doctors in front of their last name. So it must obviously be correct, right? Yeah, that's what it appears to be. <laughs> well, it's not, of course, because they're wrong. So Wagner's going to say, if it were not so serious a matter, it would be amusing to see the argument which you bring to identify the elements of the world with the ceremonial law. One would think that on this point, which you say is an important link, and which is indeed the point upon which your theory must stand or fall, you would pile up the scripture argument. And so indeed you would, if there were any to pile up. But instead, we have the opinion of Dr. Schaaf, Dr. Clark, and Dr. Scott. Three very good men, no doubt. But three men who are responsible for a vast amount of doctrinal error and false theology. After quoting Dr. Schaaf's view, that these weak and beggarly elements apply only to Judaism, you say, we trust our friends who sometimes endeavor to apply these rudiments practically to heathenism will consider this well. Has it come to this among Seventh-day Adventists that the mere opinion of a doctor of divinity must be accepted as final in any discussion? Is Dr. Schaaf so unimpeachable an authority that when he speaks, no tongue may wag dissent? Let me construct an argument from Dr. Schaaf. He says, uh, the Christian church keeps the first day of the week, which celebrates the close of the spiritual creation. 
just as the last day celebrates the close of the physical creation. We have the fullest warrant for this charge. So that's from uh, the Bible Dictionary article on the Sabbath. And now having announced this dictum of the infallible Dr. Shafe, the Sunday keeper may say, we trust our friends who still regard Saturday as the Sabbath will consider this well. Would you admit such an argument as worthy of a moment's consideration? Would you say there can be no question but that this position is correct because Dr. Shafe says so? I know you would not. Yet, if you really regard your argument on Galatians 4 verse 8 as of any value at all, you will be obliged to accept it. I want to call special attention to your argument here in order to reveal the inherent weakness of your position. You say that the elements of the world are identical with the ceremonial law. And then you add, there can be no question but that our position on this point is correct. If there can be no question on this point, it must be because it is so well fortified by the clearest proof as to admit of no argument. What is the proof which you quote? The mere words of Dr. Shafe, Dr. Barnes, and Dr. Scott. Then the inevitable conclusion is that you regard the statement of those men as sufficient to establish any point of doctrine. But I do not. I don't consider their statement as sufficient to establish any doctrine. I don't consider their statement sufficient to help, even to the slightest degree, to establish any point of doctrine. Further, I do not consider the statement of any man on earth as sufficient weight to help establish any point of doctrine. The word of God alone can decide what is right. It alone can establish a point of doctrine. And when it has spoken, nothing that any man can say can make the case any stronger. And when a thing cannot be proved by the Bible, it cannot be proved by what any man says, no matter how good he is. All men understand this. All men know that the word of God <clears throat> is better than that of any man. And so they always appeal to the Bible instead of to man, whenever they have anything that can be sustained by the Bible. I sincerely hope that at this late date, we should not have introduced among us the custom of quoting the opinion of doctors of divinity to support any theory. When our Sunday friends quote the opinions of commentators concerning the supposed change of the Sabbath, we all say that it is because they have no scriptural authority uh, to bring forward. If I am wrong on arriving <clears throat> at the same conclusion, concerning your quotation to prove the identity of the ceremonial law with the elements of the world, I trust you will pardon me and will convince me of my error by bringing forward some scripture evidence. Now, I just want to make a comment of this point. So there are times we want to quote from somebody. And what would be the reason we would quote uh, from somebody? Who, you know, it's not the Bible. Probably because you can't figure it out yourself. Well, sometimes people explain something in a way that's clear, right? Yeah. I mean, we're quoting uh, Wagner here, for instance, but we're, we're looking at the arguments that he's presented. So if I'm going to uh, quote somebody, I don't want to just quote their conclusion. I want to show their reasoning of why they come to the conclusion that they do. If I think their reasoning is sound, it might be they might be more succinct than what I could say, more clear, and 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 so I can quote a person. Nothing wrong with quoting somebody, but that's not what Butler's doing. He's both he's quoting their opinion, which is the conclusion that he believes. He's not actually looking at any of the arguments that they're using to come to that conclusion. So there's a lot of difference between just you know quoting somebody because they say something in a, in in a way that you you think other people can get because it's it's better than what you could say um and, uh, and maybe another another, another, another another reason is the appeal to authority you know all uh, the reasons we in arguments but yeah would it, anyway it probably doesn't fit into what your paradigm is you're trying to go to. Yeah. Why do we appeal to people's other opinions? One one reason I I do or have I work on is getting there is uh, having my own identity, my own thoughts. Like this is my 
my opinion, and I don't have to ask everyone else, although there is counsel, there's safety in the number of the multitude of counselors, and that's wise too. But at the same time, it's got to be me and God, you and God, eventually. So why is this a big deal for me, actually? The last two days, it occurred to me that I could hear my voice again. And my friend Theodore, you'd know a little bit about hearing that idea of, uh, it's not like a crazy can't hear my voice, but it was like my identity, me, because I heard something, it was something you were reading in one of the things about mm-hmm. Christ, the nature, or no, he loves us and wants to separate us from the sin in our lives. So he yeah. wants us. And seeing those two things as two separate things, actually. I'm not uh, I'm not a cigarette smoker. I smoke cigarettes and it's a sin, or, you know, and so on. It doesn't make you what you're doing. And Jesus sees that difference. That, that That's a cigarette. He'll take care of it or whatever the vice or whatever struggle is. But he wants you. And being able to see the uh, oneself separate from the sin, that's the preciousness that I lost track of in the city for so long. Well, and, and uh, now you know I grew up in a home where what my my mom especially, she looked not at what people did, she looked at the person behind what they did. Right? Yeah, you know? she just loved. Right. She loved the person in spite of anything about that person. Right? I mean, and, and we never heard in my home any, you know, any sort of gossip, any bad thing about anybody. Um, Not once that I recall. No, I can never. <laughs> Maybe Pastor remember. Watson, but that was out in the open. It was Duke's off. <laughs> well, well, you know, that's different. You know, when the person was there, they day. disagree. And, and, of course, that was be my dad. Yeah, it was, it was just <laughs> rigorous discussion. <laughs> but, but, you know, my parents never said anything bad about Dr. Watson. No, when he was no. There. Right. No, never. No. Yeah. It was just so, out in the open, like I said. It was fun. It was yeah. good fun. So, anyway. so I was used to the idea of like gossiping or talking about people when they're not there, like saying mean things about somebody. It just wasn't part of my upbringing. Now, um, so this goes to what you're talking about, how God looks at us. Because he looks at, at – and, and I don't want this to sound sort of sap, sappy and kind of, you know, clicheic. But, you know, God sees the person, right? He's not, and, and, and we, we make this error all the time, and especially people that rub us the wrong way, right? We, we like to look at their, their faults. But you need to see that somebody, uh, that Christ loves them and he wants to redeem them. And so when I'm in a discussion with a person, I'm not thinking about winning an argument. I'm thinking about winning the person, right? That's how I try to communicate with them. Now, some people, it's very difficult. No matter how you Amen. try to, to, to Amen. communicate Amen. with them, you know. So, you know, there are people that I know that there's no way that anything I say to them, you know, that they're going to receive it, right? And no, no matter how no, no, I personally have. You know, I try to find when a common. I have a, yeah. When I personally have a falling out with someone, I, uh, uh, the first thing I think about really is there goes my connection to them to be able to have an opportunity to influence them for eternity. Mm-hmm. Please, God, whatever I might have done, let it be a seed and take it further. I'm sorry. You know, mm-hmm. and I'm sorry more than anything when I lose a relationship about mm-hmm. that being able to have, be a heavenly influence that they might never, ever run into again. You know, feel yeah. that, that re- responsibility. Yeah, and, that is the, and a good one, you know, a good one. Okay, so... Um, you know, so um, okay, somebody had a comment? Yeah. Um, in the um, Desire of Ages, where, where is that part that you was talking about the nature of Christ? You know what um, chapter that's in? Well... So is if you six seventy eight, read that that whole section. Thank you. 
I like the one about the, the uh, no, I don't know. It's, I, I just put it in the chat. I don't know if others have had a chance to see it yet. Uh, so, uh, I didn't realize it was such an obscure location. Paulson Collection, um, I thought it was somewhere else, but you know the one where it was oh, the theme. The one of the Walla, 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 yeah. Walla Weathers. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I, I, I'm looking forward to that day. It will swell into the loud cry. This is the loud cry. No more, no more needing to look for the answer to that, I yeah. think. No, tell yeah. me yeah. what your thoughts yeah. are. And one, of, and one of the things about, let's say, you know, we've been studying chronology and prophecy and all these things. And so some people will say, well, you know, those aren't important. The only thing that matters is Christ our righteousness. But what she's saying is that when we study God's word, prophecy, all the things that are in God's word, it leads us to this understanding. Like if it's the truth, what we're studying is the truth. It's supposed to lead us to understanding Christ, our righteousness. And then, right. And then, so, I, I'll carry on from there. I'll just insert this. Okay. And then, it, it, and then we live it. Cause that's the loud cry. It's not going out with bullhorns on the corner. The loud cry will be that our witness, our countenance, they all want to veil their faces like they did with Moses, right? Right? Mm -hmm. Am I right about that? Yeah. Yeah, right. and, and so one of the things that we can say about it, this... It just so, gets me hard. It's an amazing yeah. day to, to be. Yeah. So studying, studying God's word brings a conviction, right? All the prophecies of the Bible, they're meant to bring us a conviction and to uh, enable us to have a faith and trust in God. And and, and if you don't have that, you can't just like study Christ our righteousness in and of itself, by itself. The problem is you don't have the faith, right? Because you can't you can't just work up faith. Right. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And every word of God is profitable, profitable for doctrine, reproof and instruction and righteousness. Right. So some people want to just take the. I, yeah. I'd like to jump in there just before I forget it. Um, is I think that that lack of faith has to do in, I can speak for myself. It has to do with, uh, not seeing where, where it's actually working in my life. Oh, and that's where I like that quote that the disciple are, they can see nothing good in themselves. And that's to be our experience, right? We mm -hmm. can see nothing good in ourselves. And, and Jesus even wasn't self-righteous. And he had the title. <laughs> so why right. is that important? So anything yeah. that we study, if it makes us think that we're better than other people are, there's something wrong with how we're studying. Mm. Right. Yeah. So for me, the study of what we have done coming into this movement, I mean, has changed me. Because it has brought conviction of sin, and it has shown me that God is leading, and it, it increases my faith and trust in God, but it's not an end to itself, right? Like prophecy is not an end to itself. Its purpose is, Jesus says, I've told you things before they come to pass, that when they come to pa pass, you may believe that I am he, right? So, so prophecy is to increase our faith in Christ, but often prophecy in the way that it's presented actually weakens our faith in Christ. Because it's focused upon self, right? And that's why, you know, I'm not trying to say this to be judgmental, but when we had people after July 18th who were embarrassed that the prediction failed, meant that their idea of prophecy was focused upon them. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? That why it's focused upon them? Nobody, everybody understands that? Because if our if our focus is upon God's glory, there would be no reason we would be embarrassed, right? Because it's it's from God. We just I, trust. I missed, I missed that missed that question actually. If what was okay. focused on us is that what what was it again? Yeah, so the question was: so after July 18th, many people were embarrassed that the prediction failed, and and that oh, okay. that's evidence that that they were focused upon themselves. Yeah, I, I was just shrugging my shoulders, and I don't know. <laughs> I mean, 
anyway. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Because yeah, we were trying yeah, to understand, be, actually. understand the truth. I mean, it like, would be. I mean, to be all embarrassed. cocky after Trump, all cocky after Donald Trump was elected, and right. Okay. So it's almost a setup. Good, good con. Yeah. So, so this is you know this is the issue here that you know we're 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 we're. That's what people would feel like they they had been you know, grifted. Okay. So now let's get back to this study here. So we can see that the problem of taking these these authorities that that he's addressing here. This is a different way of studying, right? Than what we study. We can we can quote people. Nothing wrong with quoting somebody, but if we quote them as an authority to prove a point, and yet we don't know their reasons for coming to that conclusion, um, then that's faulty. I mean, I mean, we could even quote them and they could have faulty arguments, but at least we can see what their arguments are. But we don't even know why they came to that conclusion. Okay, so when our Sunday friends quote the opinions of commentators concerning the supposed change of the Sabbath, we all say that it's because they have no scriptural authority to bring forward. If I am wrong in arriving at the same conclusion concerning your quotation to prove the identity of the ceremonial law with the elements of the world, I trust you will pardon me and will convince me of my error by bringing forward some scripture evidence. If you want the opinion of man on this subject, I will quote one for you. It is the opinion of a man who I regarded as being much superior to Dr. Shafe as a biblical expositor as Dr. Shafe is superior to me in the knowledge of Greek and Latin, I refer to Elder J. N. Andrews in his work, The History of the Sabbath. In a footnote on page 186, I find the following statement concerning Galatians 4.10. To show that Paul regarded sabbatic observance as dangerous, Galatians 4.10 is often quoted. Notwithstanding, the same individual claims that Romans 14 proves that it is a matter of perfect indifference. They do not, they, they not seem that this is to make Paul contradict himself. But if the connection can be read from verses 8 to 11, then will be seen that the Galatians before their conversion were not Jews, but heathen. And that these days, months, times, and years were not those of the Levitical law, but those which they had regarded with superstitious reverence while heathen. Observe the stress which Paul lays on the word again in verse 9. Okay, so he's going to quote um, J. N. Andrews, but J. N. Andrews is also making an argument here too. So he's not just quoting J. N. Andrews' opinion, he's quoting his, his scriptural argument. Um, so Wagner says, I cannot refrain from saying that I trust our friends who sometimes endeavor to imply these rudiments to the ceremonial law will consider this well. I will add also the following from Elder Andrews. The bondage of the Jewish church did not consist in that God had given them his law, but because they were its transgressors, the servants of sin. John 8, verse 33 and 36. The freedom of the children of Jerusalem, which is above, does not consist in that law, in that the law has been abolished, but in that they have been made free from sin. Um, Romans 6.22, and that's quoted from Review and Herald, Volume 2, Number 4. But I must not prolong this letter much further. I pass to a brief notice of your strictness upon my argument upon Galatians 4.21. You say, here we have the expression under the law, repeated once more. We have already dwelt at some length upon this phrase and have claimed that its uses in the letter to the Galatians referred to to being subject to the law under its authority. But one of our friends who is enthusiastic in his devotion to the view that the law in Galatians is the moral law goes so far as to claim that in every case where this expression is used, it signifies being in a state of sin or condemnation. That is, in a position where the penalty of the law hangs over one's head. That penalty is the second death in the lake of fire. We have then, according to that view, these Galatians brethren desiring to be in a state of guilt, which would expose them to the lake of fire. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, with this equivalent expression substituted, would read, tell me, ye that desire to be under the condemnation of the law. 
Tell me, ye that desire the condemnation of the second death. We have known men to desire many strange things, but we have never before knew one to desire the second death. But if that view of the subject is correct, and this law is the moral law, and all these expressions under the law mean under its condemnation, then we have no possible escape from this conclusion. But I think of these zealous converts to Christianity desiring to go into a state of condemnation exposed to such a doom is too preposterous for a moment's consideration. So that's what Butler says. And, and we can sure, surely we can see the problem with this. So Wagner's going to reply. He says, I gladly acknowledge that I'm the identical one of your friends who has claimed that in every case where the expression under the law occurs in the original, it signifies being in a state of sin or condemnation. That is, in a position where the penalty of the law hangs over one's head. And I trust that I shall never be counted as your enemy because I tell you this truth. You make sport of this idea and say that you never knew anyone who desired the second death. My knowledge is not very extensive, but I've known that very thing. In the eighth chapter of Proverbs, wisdom, which is the fear of God, is personified. And in this last verse of that chapter, she says, all them that hate me love death. There you have a plain Bible statement that there are some that love death. It is not to be supposed that men deliberately desire death, but they do deliberately choose and love the course, which must result in death. And consequently, they are said to love death. In Acts 13, 6, we read that Paul and Barnabas said to the Jews who had rejected the word of God, contradicting and blaspheming, seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Here we have a similar statement. The apostle did not mean to indicate that those self-conceited Jews thought they were not fit to enter heaven. On the contrary, they thought that they were the only ones worthy of that privilege. But they were unwilling to receive the only truth which could fit them for everlasting life. And so Paul could say to the Galatians, who were turning aside from the gospel of Christ, that they desired to be under the law. Not that they deliberately chose death, but they were seeking justification by something which could not bring them justification. They were losing their faith in Christ and being removed from God. And such a course, if carried out, would inevitably bring them under the condemnation of the law. I see nothing absurd in this position. If it is absurd, then you must attach absurdity to the words of Solomon in Proverbs 8.36. Let me prove it another way. You will admit that it, a man's own way, if followed, will always end in death. Says so Solomon, there's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And this way which seems right to a man is his own way. Now, since a man's own way is the way of death, it can truly be said that all who love their own way love death. The Galatians had turned to their own way, which is opposed to the ways of God. And so they were desirous to be under the condemnation of the law. But I have already made this letter longer than I anticipated. I have done so only because I have a deep sense of the tremendous, import, tremendous importance of this question. And I am morally certain that your theory is opposed to the truth. That those who have held it have not oftener been discomfited by the enemies of the truth is due rather to the providential blindness of those enemies than to the strength of the argument with which they have been met on this question. I've written this brief review as I did my articles in the signs with the desire to vindicate the law of God and to show its perpetuity, its binding claims upon all mankind and the beautiful harmony between it and the gospel. The law of God is the groundwork of all our faith it may be said to be the backbone of the third angel's message. That being the case, we must expect, as we approach the end, that all the forces of the enemy will be concentrated upon it. We shall have to do more valiant service for it than we ever yet have done. Every point in our argument will have to be subjected to the test of the most rigid, rigid criticism, and we shall have to fortify every point. If there is any inconsistency in any of our arguments, 
we may be sure that the enemies, enemies of the truth will not always remain blind to it. I know you will say that it will be a humiliating thing to modify our position on so vital a point as this, right in the face of the enemy. But if a general has a faulty position, I submit that it is better to correct it, even in the face of the enemy, than to run the risk of defeat because of his faulty position. Uh, but I do not see anything humiliating in the matter. If our people sh should today, as a body, as they will sometime, change their view on this point, it would simply be an acknowledgement that they are better informed today than they were yesterday. Of course, we can all take that as an individually. Being corrected is, is actually a good thing. If we have a wrong idea, it's better to correct it than to hold on to it. It would simply be taking an advanced step, which is never humiliating, except to those whose pride of opinion will not allow them to admit that they can be wrong. It would simply be a step nearer the faith of the great reformers from the days of Paul to the days of Luther and Wesley. It would be a step closer to the heart of the third angel's message. I do not regard this view, which I hold, as a new idea at all. It is not a new theory of doctrine. Everything that I have taught is perfectly in harmony with the fundamental principles of truth, which have been held not only by our people, but by all the eminent reformers. And so I do not take any credit to myself for advancing it. All I claim for the theory is that it is consistent because it sticks to the fundamental principles of the gospel. Before I close, I cannot refrain from expressing my regret to see in your book on page 78 uh, the expression, the much vaunted doctrine of justification by faith. Do you know of any other means of justification? Your words seem to intimate that you think that doctrine has been overestimated. But one thing I am certain, and that is, that those who have held to the theory of the law, which you are endeavoring to uphold, have not overestimated the doctrine of justification by faith, because that theory leads inevitably to the conclusion that men are justified by the law. But when I read Romans 3.28 and read also that Paul knew nothing among the Corinthians, but Jesus Christ in him crucified, and that the just shall live by faith, Philippians 3.9, I conclude that it is impossible to overestimate the doctrine of justification by faith. You may call it a much vaunted doctrine, if you please. I accept the word and say with Paul, God forbid that I should glory or vaunt, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Hoping that you will read this letter in the spirit in which it is written, and that you will believe that I have written it with only the utmost good feeling and brotherly love for you personally, and praying that God will guide both of us and all his people to the most perfect knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus. I remain your brother in Christ, E.J. Wagner. Okay. So this definitely is a good book to read. And and I suggest that people go over it on their own as well. A any final thoughts before we close with prayer? I thought Wagner sounds pretty sound. You know? Yeah. It's definitely sound. Um but, you know, the, the issue, you know, we, we can get caught up in the issue of righteousness by faith as, as a, a doctrine, as a discussion. But, of course, the most important thing. Turn it even to a whole. I'm sorry. Turn it even into a whole ministry. Uh, yeah. Rather than doing it. Well, yeah, it's, it, it means to be. The thing is, I preached this message pretty much, you know. Anytime I've preached, you know, when I became an Adventist and I started, when I first started preaching, it was always this message. And I did hundreds of sermons. But I would say that there's a difference between presenting a message and living a message. And I'm not saying that I didn't have any effect on anybody, but I would have much greater effect on people if I had been changed by this message. And, and that's what I, I seek. That's what all of us should be seeking is to be changed. The gospel is, is meant to change us. Okay. Well, let's close with prayer. 
A dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this evening. Thank you for the Sabbath. We ask for you to teach us and to continue to be with us. May your spirit bring that conviction and power in our lives that we can behold Jesus and his righteousness and that we can have a faith to trust in him. Um, we know, Lord, there's so many things in our lives that speak to us of, of our sin. But we know, Lord, that you love us and that you are working and seeking to finish that work that you began in us. Help us to no longer trust in self, but to trust in you. We pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.